There you go. <laughs> All right. So let me let me go through what um, through the format of of the discussion. So we have about forty five minutes, and the way we've thought about organizing this is that we'll have three sections. We have three big questions, and I think we'll be sharing that in the chat. Um, so three big questions we want to address, and um, and then each section will take up one of these questions. And so um, Allison will lead one, Jonathan will lead one, and, and I'll start us off uh, with, uh, with one question. And then we'll just have this discussion. So it'll be mostly um, Allison, Jonathan, and I um, discussing these questions. And then in the chat, um, if you have any questions or any comments, if you can include those. So we'll be devoting five minutes um, of, of each section to just answering and engaging with, uh, with your ideas and your comments. But you know, what we want is to share a little bit more um, about, we, about what we learned during the, the delegation. So happy to also answer. Um, we just don't have enough time, so we wanna make sure we, have, uh, we can go through this. So let, um, let me start. So the first... Uh, um, I put it in the chat. You put them in the chat? Okay, excellent. I put the first one. So not to confuse people, let's put the first one in there, yeah. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so this is the question we have. Um, so a lot of us who went on this delegation um, come from Central America or part of the Caribbean diaspora um, or, or the Latin American diaspora. And, uh, you know, we participated with, um, with a lot of background knowledge about the ways the United States has financed military repression in the region um, through initiatives like the Alliance for Prosperity and also CARSI. And, uh, and so the, the first question I have uh, both for, for Alice and Jonathan, and I'll come back to this and, and wrap up uh, this section is, what, what were some of the things that, that surprised you from this delegation? Um, or also just, you know, what, what did you learn that was new or what did this delegation reinforce for you in terms of um, the way in which the United States uh, sponsors militarization in the region? Um, so, <laughs> Jonathan, do you want to take that up? <laughs> okay. um, I'm from Guatemala. I was born in Guatemala um, in the 80s and I came to age um, in the United States. I've been living back and forth between Guatemala and what, Guatemala City and East in Chicago. And so I think for us in Guatemala, the war and the peace accords that was signed in 1996, the war and militarization in the army is a reality for us, right? Um, folks in human rights and resistance movements and activists and human rights offenders understand really clearly the role of, UN, of the United States and arming in the past, the uh, armed forces and providing aid, but also today, um, today the, the Guatemala has the biggest and the strongest army in Central America uh, because of the United States aid. Guatemala has the strongest infrastructure of all military forces in Central America. And, you know, it's to, to go to Central America, to go walk the streets of Honduras and Salvador and walk the streets of Guatemala, the amount of guns that you see in the streets is a constant reminder of that history. The amount of guns that you see in private security, the, the army checkpoints, the army police collaboration checkpoints is a strong reminder of that. And so for me, that reality was very clear in Guatemala, but going to Honduras and learning that, that same history, we share that same history. Uh, it was also, it's a, it's, it's unfortunate. It's a very sad reminder, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that when you, when you see it and you're confronted by it, it's like, it's, it's never easy to digest. And uh, I'll, I'll just, I'll pass that. I'll pass it over to, to Allison or Maho. Allison, do you want to share some insight? Yeah, I'll just say that that um, the the militarized the the physical like visual of of being in a place like Honduras and seeing um, both police and, and military regularly in the street uh, manning checkpoints, but also like private security guards. I think I was just in Tegucigalpa and and there's private security on every block. Uh, it seems like every private enterprise um, needs one, and it's part of the the cost of of business here um i think um living in honduras i think there was there was less that surprised me but i do 
I think one of the big things that surprised me about the, the government meetings um, from what I understood was, uh, was that the government was really open about the, the challenges that exist. One of them being that there continues to be a very serious risk of another coup in, in Honduras. Um, Rodolfo, I'm forgetting his last name, but he's um, part of uh, Xiomara Castro's inner circle, just came out with an article recently um, where he talked very openly about the fact that although the, there's a very, there's a lot of popular support in the grassroots for um, a constitutional reform, that that is just not realistic under current conditions. And he very much alluded to the fact that the, the, military, the military structure is still very much aligned with the interests that led to the, to the nine coup in the first place. And so um, that is the, the, the context in which the delegation came, a government that very much wants to uh, push reform, but um, does not have the conditions um, to do so yet um very precisely because of the the connections that continue to exist between um Honduran security forces the united states that backs them and um the economic elite in honduras um pass it over to maho wonderful and again i i i want to encourage you to just ask questions or con or add your comments in the chat box because that'll be easier for us to then uh, um I mean, we can also just open it up afterwards. But um, so, just to, I think, I think for me, in uh, you know, let me just start with sort of like the weight, right, of um, the weight of U.S. geopolitics in in these landscapes of militarization in Central America, right? This is a historic role, and I think you know, probably many of us are familiar with it. Um, I think the when we met with President Castro, we also met with with her cabinet. And uh, it's a it's a very it's a very interesting government because a lot of them, a lot of uh, those who are either ministers now were people who were in prison during the coup because they were, this was the coup in 2009 um, that overthrew democratically elected President Celaya, uh, and it was a US backed coup. Um, and so a lot of uh, the people that came out of the school that, that were protesting against it, you know, many of them are also occupying different places in government. Um, so they're not your typical government official. So for instance, we have the human rights uh, minister, um, Natalie Roque, she's a historian. And when we met, um, you know, we were meeting with, uh, uh, we, we, congressional delegates, right? We're meeting with with uh, U.S. congressional delegates. We're meeting with um, the Honduran government, and uh, you know, it was interesting to see that, um, for instance, Natalie Roque was constantly reminding um, U.S. officials, right, about this very tense um, and and just uh, you know violent relationship between U.S. And, and, and Honduras, and just you know said it like out loud, said you know in the 1980s. Honduras was known as the U, like USS Honduras because of this close relationship that Honduras and the US had and how Honduras was this um, you know, counterinsurgency uh, playing ground and really just you know, springboard um, for, for just uh, you know, destroying all the revolutionary movements in the region. And so I think it's important to just have that um, you know, in mind and also as, as part of the, the historical backdrop when we're thinking about current militarization in the region, because what we're seeing today is a continuation of that, right? Of the of of, of the heavy militarization that happened in the '80s to fight um, counterinsurgency wars today. Um, and I, I think for me, something perhaps that the was surprising is that we tend to think of militarization as just uh, um, as uh, as as pure, either pure violence, right? So like whether it's the military that are present and are, and are repressing movements, um, you know, whether that means like throwing, um, in, in the case of La Puya, for instance, in Guatemala, this community that is resisting um, a US mine, uh, a US funded mine, um, you know, they, ta they talked about um, uh, uh, the, the kind of weaponry, right, that was deployed against them. And so, of course, right, it's, it's these instances of violence. Uh, when we're talking about militarization, that's what we want to bring to light. But militarization, I think what, you know, what this uh, delegation challenged me to think about was that militarization is not just about those episodes. It's not just about those violent acts, like that the, it's part of a continuum. It includes, you know, the kind of psychological abuse, right, that also results from these violent episodes. So, 
you know, think of in, in La Puya, for example, um, some of the people who suffered from, from these violent episodes, you know, it was not just the injuries, right? Like the physical injuries that they, that they, um, that they were that were inflicted on their bodies, but also psychological injuries. So Don Angel from La Puya was telling us about um, this friend of his who was part of the resistance movement. And after this really violent episode with the military and the Guatemalan police, um, you know, he suffered depression and he died. Um, and you know, it, we don't think about the, in some ways, the afterlives, right, of ma militarization. The kind of violence that militarization brings about is not just immediate, right? It's it's a part of a continuum, and sometimes we don't actually see the effects of it. And so I think that for me, that was something that the delegation really captured. It was, in some ways, the you know, the afterlife, right? Like the con the continuation. How militarization is not just an episode but it's, it's a continuum um, of abuses against people. And that's important for us to be thinking of it that way too. Um, I, um, I think- can I, can, I, can I add something? Uh, yes, um, yes. And, and just to, to illustrate what this means, right? Like for folks in El Salvador, the army represents, you know, a bloody history of repression, right? That is again, the war, uh, death squads, assassination, uh, political prisoners, it, there's a history, right? And similar to Guatemala. Um, for us, whenever we see the military, we immediately have a cultural association to genocide, to crimes against humanity, and to what's happening today. Um, you go to Honduras today, 12 years of a narco dictatorship that most people in Honduras in the streets can easily identify and say, yes, we are coming out of a dictatorship that was funded and aided by a president with ties, if not, you know, if not himself participating and not in the, the net and in the with organized crime, it's it's all, you know, it's it's really very much all interconnected, right? What is what Maho is illustrating is the, the the legacy of US intervention in Central America, the aid that is sent to these countries. Guatemala, El Salvador, you know, the rest of Latin America, and where we are today, where we see the army in the streets today, it's, it's a continuous, it's, it's a timeline of terror and intimidation that is designed to be that way. The, you know, I'm from Chicago, the police is a para, paramilitary, and they're armed to the teeth, as they say, right? The Chicago police has so much gear on them, it doesn't seem like a police officer it seems like an army, an army soldier. It, and that's on purpose. It's meant to intimidate. It's meant to send a message to the community. It's meant to say something. We go to El Salvador, we go to the streets of Guatemala. It's meant to do the same thing. And so again, understanding where, we, where we've come from and where we are today, the presence of militarization, uh, the military aid is, is part of the plan. Again, Alliance for Prosperity, we can talk about that so much we can talk about the white house plan on, on on central america and latin america but tucked inside all of these things is a continuous continuous military aid to the region for these reasons of control for these reasons of making sure u.s interests are protected thank you jonathan um and so just to close this section i think that you're touching upon something that was very important that is very important to think about. And is this parallel between police brutality and military brutality in the United States and in Central America? Um, you know, so just to remind you, people like uh, Congresswoman Cori Bush, right, who was a central figure in, um, in, in the Black Lives Matter movement, every time we would meet with communities, either in Guatemala or in Honduras, and they would share their histories of military repression and police brutality, she would constantly make a parallel and it was, you know, it, it was very, it was very powerful because, you know, she she would insist that these were realities that were interlinked, that it was not just that the United States was doing this abroad, it was doing it to its people, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, I think that that put things into into a great perspective because then it makes us rethink how we 
how we forge bonds of solidarity between the United States and Latin America or Central America specifically, right? Where it's not just, oh, look at, you know, the poor people in Central America and how they're being attacked, right? Um, you know, let's go help them. It's that, you know, people in this country are also at the receiving end of a lot of this violence, right? And that the connections that can be drawn, um, you know, are the, the, the connections, that many connections can be drawn. Um, and it's really about, you know, people being affected by that reality of militarization that also, um, a, that, that all is also connected to the reality of militarization in Central America. Um, so let me just, you know, stop there. Um, we have, um, Yes, we're halfway through the breakout room time, um, and we have two more questions. Um, so let me turn it over to um, uh, Allison. Do you want to go next, um, and then you know we can uh, engage the question. Sure. Yeah. So you know, with the with the um, incoming Biden administration and what the U.S. has has termed the uh, uh, migration crisis, there's been this um, prioritization of Central America and of Central American development. There's um, as you all, as Maho explained earlier, there's uh, been a, a commitment of $4 billion investment into Central America to try to stem the flow of migration. These are words used by the, by the Biden administration. And on the delegation, um, uh, in, especially in Guatemala and Honduras, we, we've got to see a little bit about what, um, what economic development looks like in Honduras and, and Guatemala um, and the ways in which it, it doesn't necessarily line up with community needs, community interests and community development. Um, and so for this question, we wanna talk a little bit about what we're seeing coming out of the Biden administration as their approach to um, supporting a development in Central America versus what we're hearing from communities on the ground as to what they what their needs really are. And so I'd like to pass it over to, to Jonathan to talk a little bit about uh, what he saw in the delegation in regards to this. Um, no, thank you, Allison. I think we can spend uh, we can spend a whole day talking about um, how flawed this added, this approach is. Um, and I'll keep it very simple just to introduce another element to into this conversation. Um, there's definitely a, a healthy debate, even among grassroots community human rights defenders, a good healthy debate of what development means in a neo neoliberal context, right? Today, with the United States' influence over the global markets, US influence over local markets and US interest in every century, every Latin American country uh, being some of the most important interests for that country. Honduras is definitely not, uh, Honduras would be one of the most important examples of that coming out of, you know, Juan Orlando Hernandez's dictatorship, having a crisis, uh, a government economic crisis and Xiomara Castro trying to figure that out. And then Guatemala having one of the largest indigenous populations in the continent uh, per capita, um, having a history, an incredible history of resistance, pushing forth community consultation processes to address any type of development plan, any type of aid, any type of anything that would touch their communities, right? And so I wanna highlight that specifically, that. There is a conversation happening about what development from the perspective of any government, when the government of Guatemala says, we'd like to bring electricity to your rural community. Uh, the people have 500 years of history from the state trying to come into their communities and tell them what to do. And so they, with a lot of good information, with a lot of good history, oftentimes resist. And it's not resisting the building of a road or resisting the building of uh, an electrical grid in their communities, it's resisting an imposition that doesn't take their opinions and their process, their, their indigenous or ancestral processes into play, into, into account, right? And so again, the community consultation processes and indigenous resistance often reject any neoliberal state-minded US supported idea of uh, development. And again, when we look at it, as Maho said in the introduction, when you look at the White House plan, it might seem, it might seem comprehensive to some, it might seem common sense to all, but the United States is, is, is with one hand, destabilizing countries, and with the other hand, giving money to USAID for economic development that gets lost in the state, that gets privatized, and doesn't really ask any rural community what it really wants. 
Um, yeah, let me let me maybe just share two stories that I think really capture the effects of mega development projects in the in the region. And one is from Guatemala, um, and and the other one is um, is from Honduras. Um, and so the first one is from is from uh, is from La Cuchilla. So La Cuchilla is this this small community um, in southern Guatemala, and this is a community that. I mean, today, right, as part of this Xinca, so the Xinca indigenous resistance against the Escobal mine. And the Escobal mine um, is, is uh, one of the largest silver mines in the world, right? Um, it has been, it's currently stopped, uh, but there's fear that it, it will continue operating. Um, and, you know, what, what um, I won't, I won't give um, her name, um, uh, but um, this, 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 uh, um, this compañera from, from Guatemala, from La Cuchilla, so she used to live there um, with her family, you know, and she described how living in this, this small town, um, you know, was just uh, a peaceful life um, in many ways, right? It wasn't, it's not that they were rich, but they, they led a peaceful life, um, you know, and suddenly, suddenly the houses started cracking. Like out of nowhere, the houses just started cracking. And so the, the, the main school, the main church just cracked open, um, you know, completely. And at first people didn't know what was happening. <laughs> um, of course, uh, very, very soon they learned that it was because the, the mine um, was already operating. So they had built these underground tunnels under La Cuchilla, which is this, this small village uh, up kind of up in the mountains um, and the, and and the 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 underground tunnels right were being used to like either move machine machinery or just to start building these mines um, and it was it was causing all of these 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 problems right um, 90 families had to leave right like nine, this is a, this is a US Canadian uh, mine 90 families had to leave this la cuchilla because they were scared that their houses would literally just like fall apart, right? And that they, you know, they would basically die in, in their sleep because they could crack open, they just could crack any time. Um, the, the, the compañera who was, um, you know, sharing the story, um, she, was, she was not, um, her, her son had to migrate um, and her other, her other children was considering uh, migrating to the United States. So like direct effect, right, of a mine that was constructed in this town that completely, completely unraveled um, the lives of the people who were, who were, um, who were in La Cuchilla. Uh, and so that ju that's just you know, one example, right, um, of how much destruction this mine brought about. None of the people who lived here agreed um, to the construction of this mine. They were never consulted. Um, even though they have the right to consultation right under Convention um, 169, um, but they weren't consulted. Another example from, um, from Honduras, um, so Gilamito, and this is a Gilamito resistance camp, again, resisting a mine. Um, it's uh, um, it also receiving funding from the United States through the uh, Investment Development Bank. And this, uh, this, um, one of the compañeras who was sharing, right, the kind of resistance that they're, that they're mounting in this part of Honduras was telling us about these recent, you might have heard, but of the Eta and the Yota hurricanes that hit, I mean, really ravaged parts of Central America, um, November of last year. And she was saying how because so many of the rivers um, had been dammed, um, they face flooding that they had never faced, not even during Hurricane Mitch, where like, you know, half of the country was virtually destroyed. Um, and this was due to these dams that were constructed on, on like all of the rivers. And the one they're fighting, like their, their protection, right, of the Hilamito River is against the building of a hydroelectric dam, right? So this, for them, you know, I just highlighted um, like, you know, why they want to protect the river, why they want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, oppose the construction of these projects. So those are just, you know, I just wanted to give you like a sense, right, of the, the people we were talking to, the stories that they're facing. Um, this is what's happening. So when we read in the, in the Biden-Harris plan um, that they want to encourage more private investment, more of these kinds of development projects, then, you know, we, we were very suspicious um, for, for a good reason. So let me end there. Thank you, Maho. Yeah. Jonathan, do you want to say something? No, go ahead. 
Yeah, just to to, to tie the a little these threads together a little bit. You know, the migration in, in from Central America is is for a variety of reasons. One of the the ones that is well known is is all the counterinsurgency efforts that happened in, in the eighties, but. You know, there's also climate change migration as, re as a result of the United States and other of the world's major polluters. And there's also migration as a result of privatization. I think labor insecurity is, is a huge problem in, in Honduras, as are displacement as a result of these extractive projects that we've been talking about. And so when we look at like the primary drivers of migration to the United States, I mean, towards the United States, what you find is a lot of um, historical policy that the United States has enacted. And the thing that is very discouraging about the Biden plan is that when you look at it, it's a lot of the same strategies, same logics that created the crisis in the first place. Um, and so like already we're seeing the, the impacts of that, especially in Honduras. Kamala Harris did a, a tour to Central America, um, visited Guatemala, visited Honduras, skipped El Salvador. And, um, and it's very much concentrating in Honduras because it sees, they see it as like one of the most reliable partners in the region, which means that a lot of money is being concentrated there. There's been an ambassador that just recently got um, um, appointed to, to Honduras and already there are very concerning um, uh, posturing coming out of that embassy. So Honduras just passed an energy reform proposal um, that uh, would allow them to renegotiate contracts um, for energy and would allow them to expropriate um, in areas where corporations don't want to uh, renegotiate. And um, the U.S. Embassy has, has expressed concern over this, um, is very much pushing further privatization at a moment when Honduras is trying to nationalize its energy um, precisely because of, of the issues with um, corruption and with mismanagement that has occurred as a result of like U.S. efforts to privatize various industries in, in Honduras. And, um, and so we're already seeing a lot of, a lot of the same in, in, in ways that are astounding, really, uh, that, that lessons have not been learned um, yet. Uh, and so I don't know if anyone else wants to add before we close this section. I, I just, I just want to add one, uh, two things. I, I highly encourage, because th this is legislation, this is the topic right now. I encourage you all to, to read through it. Uh, maybe not read through it, but find, find a, good, a, a good analysis, a good summary um, on it. And you know, their, their idea of solutions um, is, is very, very peculiar, right? And, and, and but, it, but not surprising, right? Promote investment uh, and reforms, partner with private, the private sector, um, climate change and food security, um, opportunities for women and minor minorities. And I think the, the, the problematic thing about that is that privatization, which is a strong, strong, strong element of this, continues uh, to take away the responsibility from the state to address these, uh, to, to address any of this, right? Like, uh, wh why would we need to privatize healthcare in, in Guatemala? Um, how we, do, do we not understand how the healthcare system is fail is failing in Guatemala, let alone in the United States? I mean, it, there's just a lot of irony in it. It almost it almost feels like an inside joke, right? To, to be telling Guatemala uh, to to strengthen its climate change uh, efforts when the United States is one of the major contributors, uh, contributing countries to the climate emergency, and countries like Guatemala. The percentage um, of their influence uh, on, cl on the climate emergency is so minimal. Again, the, the, these suggestions for for how how to help and support Central America really, but as Allison said, it's yeah, like we haven't learned our lesson yet. Interesting. Um, Go ahead, Maho. Sorry. Yeah, I just I just want Brigitte. How much time do we have left? Do you know? I think, oh, I think 15 minutes? minutes or less. 15? Yeah, it's yeah, supposed to be a 45 like minute session. Yeah. A little less. Because yeah. I also, you know, I'm, I'm wondering at this point, we still have one more question. And we, I, I also want to 
create a bit of space for us to either, you know, for you to be able to ask questions, for us to expand on anything we've talked about. Um, and maybe just quickly before we do that, or Allison, I don't know if you want to wrap up. I did want to mention El Salvador. Um, we didn't go to El Salvador, but we met with a delegation from El Salvador, as Lulu mentioned in the introduction. And just uh, I just wanted to sh quickly share one critique that they were um, that they were making about the U.S. plan for Central America, and it has to do with the private-public partnerships. So that has that's in vogue. You know, this is sort of like uh, paraded as a new solution also to the problems of Central America. Um, and these these private-public partnerships are part of what Jonathan is also is is, is an element of that uh, process of privatization, Jonathan, that you're describing. Um, it is a process of privatization that we're familiar with in the U.S. as well, right? And that you know, you know, many of you have thoughts about and, and probably and, and maybe and probably oppose. Um, so it's a similar dynamic. That's something that's being criticized. Um, another thing that is being criticized is also just um, this focus on job employment. Um, so if you know job creation is always seen as kind of like the you know, the solution to all problems. Um, it's not, you know, it's not to say that there is a severe lack of employment in the region, uh, but the ways at least in, the, in, in which the United States envisions right, job creation is deeply tied um, to U.S. economic interests, for instance, in maquila production, right, in like the sweatshops. Um, so the United States is um, the largest employer in El Salvador, for instance, like with, 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 you, with its, its, its maquilas, its, its sweatshops. Um, and so the delegation also just, this delegation from El Salvador that visited us in, in Honduras also just shared uh, some of their, um, their reservations, right, about the kind of labor exploitation that they think, you know, is, is, is being seen, like it's being promoted as almost a solution um, to, to, to the problem of, of poverty in the region. Um, and these are communities and, uh, you know, kind of like popular social movements, right, that have another vision of what El Salvador could look like, that it's not just creating precarious job opportunities that will exploit Salvadorans and that will, you know, end up benefiting uh, big U.S. companies, right, like, you know, Haynes, all these companies that make our clothes and, you know, um, so just wanted to share that also, uh, because that's Thank part you. of the critique that was shared with us. So, um, okay, we have, I think, 10 minutes. Allison, if you want to say something else, otherwise, we just also open it up um, for discussion. Any questions you might have? There's a really good question in the chat um, by Frank Schneider. But yeah, go ahead, Allison. Yeah, I think I think given the time limitations, we can skip the the third question and, and just open it up to to answer questions. I um yes, to Frank's question, I was also thinking about this. Um, it's interesting. We're doing this monitoring of USAID projects in in Honduras because there's going to be this big injection of money from USAID to Honduras. And on the USAID website, they make it uh, very like one of their openly stated objectives is part of their work is to open markets for the United States. And so oftentimes when you see US-led development projects in Honduras, um, they pitch it as a win-win, like, oh, development for you and also like more money for us. But it's very often not what is best for the community. It is what will marginally benefit them at best, but it's mostly for the interest of the United States. Great example is the energy conversation in Honduras right now. Uh, someone who works for the, the public like energy company, the national energy company, says that given the contracts that are on the books, Honduras should, is producing more energy than it needs. And yet there are energy shortages all over the country, right? And when you look at the Biden plan to like double the capacity of Central America to, to produce energy, it's also tied to um, uh, this project to like create a common grid across uh, the hemisphere that would allow countries to buy and sell energy. So what we're seeing as a future is Honduras uh, producing energy and selling it off, right, while their people don't have energy. So that's the kind of development that the United States pushes, right? It's development that uh, that is that furthers their interests, in this case, energy security for the United States, um, having nothing to do with the community wants. Hilamito is a perfect local example of that, right? Where people want the Hilamito River preserved for uh, drinking water. Honduras is going through, there are droughts popping up all over the place. Atlantida doesn't have one, but they might in the future, and they want that river preserved. For drinking water, they want a small hydroelectric project that would allow the water to get to their communities. And yet, right, that community will 
is being brutally repressed um, to allow for a huge hydroelectric dam that would allow this company to make money. Um, and those are the kinds of projects that the United States backs. Um, and you'll see examples of that all over the place where you see United, the United States pushing a project, it's for their interest, it's not for community interests. And so it's not that communities are against development, it's that they want autonomy over what that development looks like and United States partnerships do not allow for that. And, and to Frank's question, if I can, Majo, um, I, I think it's, I think in, in I think in most contexts, it would be it would be very hard for us to re, to recognize or 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 many people again specifically the state right specifically the State Department or or the United States government or the Guatemala government uh, the Honduras government to recognize when a community consultation process and has taken place and they just say we just don't want the hydroelectric plant we don't want the electrical grid. We don't want the roads. It's just, it goes contrary to any, any plan of development that any state wants for its country, right? Because what that means is a road and an electrical grid and a hydroelectric plant allows for commerce to come through the region, right? And so for any community uh, to reject that, it just, it, it may not, it, it makes no sense, right? For any community to organize itself and thousands of people to vote against that makes no sense uh, under a neoliberal capitalist mindset. And so whether they have all the information or not, which in itself I think is racist to think about that, right? Whether they have the information, their cosmovision, as we say in Guatemala, their worldview is so much different than that of any capitalist neoliberal agenda, right? And so People know and from experience, I tell you, people understand what development from that perspective is. People understand what building a road and bringing um, a hydroelectric plant. And that, that as Allison says, the energy will be sold to other countries. The energy is in, in fact not going to be consumed by the country. Um, in Guatemala royalties uh, don't necessarily end up in communities, let alone the state. And so it is really a lot of these transnational corporations, a lot of these mega projects end up giving the money to other corporations. Not even the state in, in Guatemala or Honduras is case, in the case retains those, those profits. And so again, I think people do understand what development is from the perspective, from that perspective. When the state says, we want a development project for you, I, I know for a fact that they understand it. It's just, they just don't want it. Uh, a lot of the times. And I think it's hard to understand that. It's hard, again, for the state of Guatemala, for the US you know, Department of State, for, for private interests in the United States to say, we don't want a road, we don't want electricity in our communities because it means polluting the water, destroying the mountains and not having life and, our, and future generations not having uh, their own livelihood, so. Can I Thank you, Jonathan. Um, just just wanted to respond quickly to Una. I hope I'm not misspelling your name, um, but um, thanks thanks for yes, thanks for your your question comment. Um, it's true that, and you can read it in the chat. Um, it, it's 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 true that a lot of the things you know we've we've probably been talking about all of these issues for for a really long time. I think for many of you in the audience, it's and in this group, it's not, not, none of this is new, right? I mean, you've been hearing about it all along. And so, you know, what about the resilience of the people who are there? Because I think it's also important, and this is something we witnessed. I think it's something we experienced together as well. At least for me, every time we were visiting communities that were resisting these either big development projects or militarization, all of these problems that we're talking about, people keep living, right? Um, and they keep living in, in all kinds of ways, through music, through sharing, through food. I think Lulu, um, when, when she introduced the delegation, I think she did it, you know, she put it beautifully, right? Like she kind of listed all the foods that we shared with a lot of the communities that received us. Um, you know, we're talking about communities that are not are not resource rich, right? Um, are not necessarily wealthy. And yet just, I think for 
you know, for me, I don't, I can't speak for others, right? But just, it is truly humbling to see, um, to go to a lot of these resistance camps where people have been living there for more than 10 years. It's amazing, right? Just like to envision, I think that resilience and to know that in spite um, of, you know, the, the projects being the same, in spite of the problems being the same, I think it's, uh, to me, and this is not just, you know, to give people hope, right? Because I think that's um, I, that's not necessarily um, what I'm trying to get at, but it's just that, you know, we need to, it's kind of in seeing the ways that people share in these very horizontal structures, at least try to share in these horizontal structures, like they're, they're structures of care, right? So like a lot of, a lot of these places where the resistance camps were mounted, uh, whether it was against mining or against the hydroelectric dam, these are spaces where like, you know, children are running around, people are sharing, people are sleeping. And I think just to see how that happens, like it's, it's almost like a world is being created there, right? Like the alternative is there, like it's being created there. There. Um, and I think just, you know, for me, it, it, it was very humbling to see that. Um, and that gives us strength to continue, I think, just, you know, to, to mention something that um, Doña Licha, this very wise woman, um, told us in La Puya, right? She was saying, I've been fighting right against this, uh, this mine for a really long time, you know, was one of the people most involved, right? And, you know, she said, I don't know if we're going to win. I don't know if we're going to win. But I'm fighting because, you know, I want I want a better life for my grandchildren. She might not see it for herself, right? And so that's hard to explain, like what drives, you know, what drives communities to keep resisting and fighting. Um, I think it's important to highlight that it's not always just an opposition, right? Like what defines mm -hmm. communities is not their opposition to these big uh, projects. It's really like the lives that they create together. Um, and so I think uh, for many of us that 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 is inspiring, that also gives us a sense of where we want to move, how we want to create futures. Um, so thank you so much for that question. Una. I think it's all it's very important to highlight that. Um, I think we're gonna they're gonna take us back to the big room now. I saw a message, um, but I don't or I don't know if we still have time. I just saw a message that they might send us back to the big. Um, they might, they might. They might, right? So, yeah, but I don't know. I think someone also wanted to comment. One minuto. We have one more minute. One minute. Okay, so maybe, did I see that someone, Alan Fisher? It's Anna. I miss Anna. it. Spell it oh, okay, okay, Anna, but yeah. Really quick, I, I'm, I'm really grateful that all of you, and give me hope, that all of you younger people are going there and know the root causes why we came. I came illegally, but that's another story in the 80s. But these are exactly the root causes that the lawyers need to argue in court when they go fight for our immigrant families, because that's why our families come here. It's not that we want to come. I never wanted to come, but I was forced to come is precisely because these root causes, violence, crime, mining, hydroelectric dams, El Salvador is small, but we fought against the mining. And I think that I just came back from Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and we see this over and over. And I'm so happy to see everybody fighting back. We need to stand up against this powerful country and continue submitting uh, and lobbying with our Congress people. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Gracias, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Well, 60 seconds. I just want to say really quick, we did come back full of hope. I was able to meet Majo, I was able to meet Allison, and now we're doing this webinar together. Um, so we are full of hope and probably more angry, but full of hope. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah this, this weekend, uh, there was a hunger strike in the Capitol and uh, all these communities came to lobby their, their reps. And uh, there was this little toddler who um, was in his mom's belly as she was being tear gassed defending a hydroelectric dam and for him to be in the Capitol um, under new context, uh, I think, you know, he's the reason why people keep going. I, that, that was something that was told to me over yes. and over and over again. Um, so 